Welcome to Northwest Bible Church. Glad you joined us this morning. We're continuing our look at the subject of courageous Christianity out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, today we arrive at a, a passage of scripture that is uh, familiar, I think, to most Christians. And yet we want to dive into it a little deeper than uh, normally we would because there's some significant truths on how to live uh, courageously as a Christian. I want to begin by reading our passage this morning, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5. I want to read 13 through 23, and I want to read it from the, the paraphrase of J.B. Phillips. Live together in peace, brothers, and we appeal to you to warn the unruly, encourage the timid, help the weak, and be very patient with all men. Be sure that no one repays a bad turn with a bad turn. Good should be your objective always, among yourselves and in the world at large. Be happy in your faith at all times. Never stop praying. Be thankful, whatever the circumstances may be, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Never damp the fire of the Spirit, and never despise what is spoken in the name of the Lord. By all means, use your judgment and hold on to whatever is good. Steer clear of evil in any form. May the God of peace make you holy through and through. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this incredible passage of Scripture. May we learn to be not just courageous Christians, but contagious Christians. Thank you for your Holy Spirit's enlightening to our hearts and our minds right now as we look into your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It seems to me that the people who get the most out of life desire to be not just victorious, not just courageous, but contagious people. And that implies that you desire to be different. It seems to me that so much of life can be categorized as, well, just boring. Um, it, it, it just seems to get long. William McNamara, the author, wrote a book entitled The Human Adventure. And in it are these honest words. My grievance with contemporary society is with its decrepitude. There are few towering pleasures to allure me, almost no beauty to bewitch me, nothing erotic to arouse me, no intellectual circles or positions to challenge or provoke me, no burgeoning philosophies or theologies, and no new art to catch my attention or engage my mind. No arousing political or social or religious movements to stimulate or excite me. There are no free men to lead me, no saints to inspire me, no sinners enough to either impress me or share my plight, no one human enough to validate the going lifestyle. It is hard to linger in that dull world without being dulled. I stake the future on the few humble and hearty lovers who seek God passionately in the marvelous, messy world of redeemed and related realities that lie just in front of our noses. Wow. It seems to me that we really need in this world a body of people whose lives demand explanation. Now that statement is not original with me. It was original with Dr. Lloyd Ogilvie, who was the former chaplain of the United States Senate. Our lives, if they are to be contagious, will be lives that demand an explanation. People will want to know how come you're so much like that? Now, when we talk about being contagious, I'm talking about in the right sense. We're all contagious in one respect, 
And the problem is that more often than not, we are infecting people with the wrong germs. Not the unhealthy contagion. That's what I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. It's interesting. The dictionary Webster's says to be contagious is to communicate by contact to be catching. When people are contagious, there is an influence that spreads from their lives that simply can't be turned off. And I'm talking about contagious in the right sense. We find ourselves often inspired by them, challenged by them, and often rebuked by them without their really rebuking us verbally. They convince us of the good way to live. They inspire us to, gre to reach for a better destiny. And it takes courage to live like that. Jeremiah, the prophet in the Old Testament, was challenged. If you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, how will you compete with horses? I mean, if the, if the infantry wore you out, how in the world are you going to deal with the cavalry? If you stumble when in a safe country, how will you manage in the jungle of the Jordan? When things are going really well for you and you feel and you find yourself swamped by your own self-imposed self neurosis, what are you going to do when the jungle fighting really starts? Jeremiah was challenged to be contagious, to be different in this dull world. Many of our Christian heroes had that kind of courage. Study the life of St. Francis of Assisi. If you Google pictures of him, you'll see an older, stoop-shouldered man who is talking to the birds and playing around in a garden and lived a life, it seems, that was about as exciting as watching paint dry. But that's not St. Francis. Did you know that he had a nickname? His nickname was Jocular Domini, the hilarious saint. And, and what about Mother Teresa, to name another Catholic saint? Can you imagine Mother Teresa waking up to an alarm in Calcutta at 4.30 in the morning thinking, oh crap, another day in the ghetto? I don't believe she ever started a day like that. Or ever complained about a lumpy mattress or the hot days and the long nights. There's something contagious about people like that. I love being around folks like that and, and to be infected with the germs of, of the encouragement we get just from their life. I, I, I want to do better. I, I, I want to accomplish more. When I'm around those people, I, I feel like I can reach new heights. There is within each one of us every day a choice. And the choice is to either spread poison or encouragement. Negativity or optimism. And I think the New Testament is filled with sufficient challenge to send us in the right way. And I think 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is just such a place. Now, if you have your Bibles and you turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, there is a whole list of things that, that will do that for us. And, and I want us to notice that the, this list really evolves out of a statement. And that statement that Paul makes is in back in verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. 
I think if there were, if we were to paraphrase that verse, it would go something like this. Be contagious in your enthusiasm, in your encouragement. Be an edifier at, just as a habit of your life so that when anyone leaves your presence, even if, it, even if it's there, they're there for a reproof, they feel built up. Now, now that's a challenge. To be contagious in putting courage into someone else. And that's exactly what encouragement means. And so the first question I think I need to ask us is, are you courageous enough to be contagious? The word encourage, verse 11, means just what it says to put courage into someone. The root word entheos is where we get our word enthusiasm. And entheos means in and theos, God. Putting God into another life. That's what encouragement means. Unless Paul leaves us here with just the mocking sound of a command, he adds a list of things that we can do as we wrap ourselves uh, up like a gift and give ourselves to other people. Last time we saw Paul mentions two things that he kindly requests. Verse 12, respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. So we're supposed to respect our spiritual leaders. And then the second thing is in verse 13, be at peace among yourselves. So we are to commit ourselves to living at peace with everyone. And then he challenges us with some things that were urgently needed. Verse 14, we urge you brothers. And, and now he gets a little closer to home. Uh, these, these things are going to have an impact on the dull world. There are some things that need to mark our lives. And notice those five things. We are to, verse 14, admonish the idle. I put down warn the unruly, because if they're not willing to be warned and change their idleness, God will bring about consequences. So we warn the unruly, we encourage the faint-hearted, the discouraged, we help the weak, we are patient with everyone, and then in verse 15 he says, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil, and we said last time we refuse to retaliate. I was driving home today uh, from my job and I saw a guy that had a bumper sticker on the back of a, an older car. We were driving on the freeway, it's, it's, I'm recording this on Friday night and, and <laughs> we had a lot of traffic on I-5 in Seattle, the Seattle, Washington, Tacoma area. And the, the bumper sticker read, I don't get mad, I get even. And he was actually going rather slowly on I-5 in, in traffic and was leaving a lot of room in front of him. And I thought, you know what? I'm not going to... I'm not going to go in front of him. Because I'm not sure if today is the day that he decides to get even. Don't get even. You'll never be contagious in the right way if you spend your life getting even. Okay? But then Paul goes further. We stopped there last time, otherwise I would have run out of time. But when we get to verses 16 to 20, we cross, we come across some things that are completely and continually appropriate. Look at verse 16. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, do not quench the whole of the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. And then there's one thing that is occasionally uncertain, and he tells us, verse 21, to test everything, hold to what is good, 
abstain, abstain from every form of evil. So what are these things that are continually appropriate? If we want to be contagious in the right way, we need to work on these things that are continually appropriate. And the first one is to rejoice always. I cannot think of anything more contagious than genuine joy. Now, I know some people who say, hey, I'm joyful, but I just don't show it. Well, the challenge is if you're truly joyful, you can't keep from showing it. Now, I'm not saying you have to be a cheerleader or that you have to have a lot of charisma or there, you have to have a certain personality. You don't have to be a really demonstrative person. But joy germs can't help seeping out from a person who is joyful. Even quiet people can be contagiously joyful. How do I know if someone is joyful? They have a remarkable humility about them, even a sense of humor, which comes from the godly perspective they have about themselves. They don't take themselves too seriously. They know God is in control and God promises his good. And so they remain joyful because God is involved. They tend to have an optimistic outlook on life. And there's this focus on the, on the prevention or the healing of problems rather than just on how hard life is. This kind of joyful perspective enables us to and we'll talk about it in a few minutes, living above our circumstances. That we see beyond the, the differences that separate us and, and, and we find and see the things that unite us. We don't focus on people's faults. We, we overlook them. We, we, we seek to highlight and value their skills and their talents and their abilities. There was a French... Jesuit priest named Pierre Telhard de Cardin. And he wrote this, Joy is the surest sign of the presence of God. Joy is a sense of confident well-being because you trust implicitly in God. We have faith. But how do we have joy? How, do, how does joy become? It, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit, right? One of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, etc., etc. Joy is something produced in us as a result of our connection with God. And so, of course, rejoicing always comes as a response to praying without ceasing. You see how these are linked together? If you try to rejoice always without prayer, your laughter is going to dry up. You'll just become a jokester, and, and nobody ever really wants to be just around a jokester. The only way that we can have a heart full of joy is to have a heart free of of the burdens. And to have a heart that is free of the burdens means you've got to release them. And there's only one way to release the burden, and that is through prayer. A number of years ago, I, I, I stumbled across a paraphrase that said, pray with the frequency of a hacking cough. You ever had a tickle in your throat that wouldn't go away? One of those coughs that you, you coughed all day? Every minute or two or three, you're just, you just can't help yourself? When an ordinary person makes life difficult, you feel that tickle of anxiety. 
you release it in prayer. When the worry or fear or impatience begins to irritate you, you release that in prayer to the Lord. Lord, I trust you in this. This is frustrating me. Calm my heart. Philippians chapter 4 says that we are to rejoice in the Lord always, he says, and again I will say rejoice by everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which you can't even explain, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. You will become extraordinary when prayer becomes a natural moment by moment part of your everyday life. Now obviously when Paul says pray without ceasing, he's not talking about getting down on your knees, folding your hands and closing your eyes. He's just talking about having an intimate connection with his spirit who lives within you on an ongoing basis. Now, what's the genius of this spiritual discipline? Well, there really are two things. One is prayer, as Philippians 4 states, it's, a, it's, it's tremendously therapeutic. We are carrying burdens we were never meant to carry. <clears throat> and when we carry those things and they weigh us down, I like to picture the burdens of life as rocks in a bag that are chained to our back. And the chain is around our, and we're dragging these things through life. Prayer cuts the chains. Prayer is a direct, a direct pipeline to God's wisdom, His perspective. That's why prayer works. I've never seen it fail. I am freed from the anchor that drags me down because I receive the help I need and the insight from God fueled by His wisdom, not mine. So I'm to rejoice always. I am to pray without ceasing. Then He says I need to develop a grateful mindset. Verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances. Did you notice that it is an always matter of rejoicing? It is a continual, continual mindset of prayer, and it is in everything I give thanks. I've mentioned this before. The apostle doesn't say that we are to be grateful for everything, but in everything. There's a significant difference. I am not grateful for sin. I'm not grateful for the failures because we give in to the lies of the enemy. I'm not grateful for the, the angst that we feel because of a broken relationship. I'm not grateful for children who are walking away from the Lord, but I can be gr thankful in all circumstances because God is engaged, God is involved. We aren't thankful for a sinful, the sinful behaviors or the pain that they bring in the form of consequences. I never pray, Lord, thank you that that other child attacked my son's efforts today and, and caused them emotional pain. I don't thank God for that. I don't thank God for the storms in life or for the calamity that knocks me to my knees, or for the misunderstanding that happened between me and someone else. But I can be grateful in the storms, in the calamity, in the misunderstanding, that God's at work. He will work out His plan that will cause those circumstances to develop our spiritual character 
our depth of understanding. He promises, Romans 8, 28, to bring his glory and our good in the midst of immense wrong. You know, a lot of times our life is like the backside of a Persian rug. I don't, you, I don't know if you've ever seen the backside of a Persian rug. It is, it is a mess of all different th threads and knots and everything all over the place. But boy, you look on the other side and it is a, it is a beautiful piece of art. God's sovereign hand is weaving the tapestry of our lives. And I, I give him thanks because I know that he not only sees the other side, but he's in charge of weaving the tapestry of my life. We can also be grateful for the occasional insights that he provides at the low tide that we wouldn't otherwise see. There are times when things occur in life, and, and, and I am just baffled. I, I, have, I have no idea why. I have no idea what to do. But then, months later, maybe years, looking back, I'm not baffled at all. I'm amazed at the insights that God has provided as we look back. Ruth Harms Calkins writes in her book, Lord, it keeps happening and happening. Quote, O oh God, you have driven me into a corner where I cannot escape. I come to you penitently, for today I have sinned grievously. I have betrayed my highest ideals. I have been false to my inner convictions. I know I have broken your heart. Thank you. Listen to the gratitude. Thank you for dealing with me in the privacy of your personal pre presence. For my sin has been against you alone. Cleanse me, Lord. Change me. Sin is so hideous, so outrageous. Renew me until I am spiritually contagious. In the act of coming to God and giving thanks for Him, even in my mistakes, even in my sin, asking Him to cleanse me, I can be thankful in them. And when I do that, I become contagious. Contagious people aren't perfect. They're forgiven. They are folks who claim the forgiveness that God grants, and they live in light of that forgiveness. And as a result, we can live grateful lives regardless. Now, Notice that the first three things listed here uh, that are continually appropriate are positive. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. God's will for your life is gratitude, developing that mindset. But then he mentions two negatives. Do not quench the Spirit, verse 19. This is the capital S Holy Spirit who lives within each true believer. Now we know from the Word of God that the Holy Spirit would never leave us because the Lord promised that He is the seal of our redemption, First uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. So, it's not a question of living my life separate from the Holy Spirit. That's not possible. But it is about living my life with Him on hold. You see, He is the contagion. He is the fire within us that not only burns away sin, but He also softens our hearts 
to God's Word. He sensitizes us to spiritual things, to the hurting cries of those around us, and He heats up our passion to tell the world to live as as a message of His grace. However, as as a believer, we can choose not to listen to His voice. We can choose to smother His influence with a blanket of stubbornness and pride. He's always there, ready to ignite our hearts, but He will not force Himself on us. Thus His influence smolders. He steps back and He waits. Have you ever had that experience? Let me show you the words of an Old Testament prophet named Hosea. The prophet observed God dealing with the sinful people of Israel in the same way. He he refers to Israel as Ephraim in his journal. God has worked with Ephraim and worked with Ephraim and worked with them, and, and they still stiffen their neck like a stubborn mule. Notice the progression here, or the regression. The revolters have gone deep into slaughter, but I will discipline all of them. I know Ephraim and Israel is not hidden from me. For now, O Ephraim, you have played the whore. Israel is defiled. Chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. Down to verse 11. Ephraim is oppressed, crushed by judgment, because he was determined to go after filth. That's when we get ourselves in trouble. Determined to go our own way. And then Hosea, in his own words, records what God did next. But I am like a moth to Ephraim, like dry rot to the house of Judah. To get their attention, he let his people be eaten as if by moths and decay, by problems and troubles. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to the great king, but he was not able to cure cure you or heal your wound. What did the Lord do next? For I will be like a lion to Ephraim, like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will carry off and no one shall rescue. From a slow nibbling to brutal devouring, the Lord was going to the extreme to restore Israel's faith. But there are some that still get away from the lion. They still do not repent. Verse 15, I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face and in their distress earnestly seek me. That's called divine silence. The affliction of God's absence, the horror of loneliness, the lack of God's assistance. That is the worst possible, imaginable discipline for a believer. When you pray and it feels like your prayers can't even get above the ceiling. Better, in my mind, for God to be a roaring lion than a wisp of air, leaving a death-like hush and a cold, barren loneliness from having no contact with God. One of the most fearful statements in the whole book of Hosea is chapter 4, verse 17. 
Ephraim is joined to idols. Leave him alone. Now, you know, in church, we, we tend to have a lot of fun together. We, I love the laughter and the joy that comes with fellowship. But, you know, there are times that we have to get downright serious. And this is one of those times. Don't play games with the Spirit of God. When we walk away from the Holy Spirit of God, He will leave us alone. When we stubbornly pursue our own idols, our own agenda, when we keep pushing Him away, he will eventually say, okay, you're on your own. And you will hate that. However, if we fan the flames by remaining dependent and obedient, we will once again experience his active power within our lives. That contagious presence of God for all to see. Don't quench the Spirit of God. And if you have, acknowledge that you have, repent, ask Him to become the driver of your life again. While on that subject, he adds, do not despise godly advice or instruction. Verse 20, do not despise prophecies. Now, there needs to be some background, I think, that needs to be explained. Apparently, in the city of Thessalonica, some of the believers were discounting all prophecies because they had come under the sway or influence of some false ones. Perhaps ones who had quit their jobs and, and were spreading wrong information about future events. The Church of Jesus Christ has been ripped off by false prophets. Every time there is a true messenger, you're going to find a false one pretty close. One, get, one man gives some context to what they faced. When God plants wheat, Satan sows tares. Wherever God establishes a church, the devil erects a chapel. To do so, whenever the Holy Spirit enables certain men to perform miracles of healing, the evil one distributes his lying wonders. And whenever the Spirit brings a true prophet on the scene, the deceiver presents his false prophet. That's what happened in the city of Thessalonica. So what happened on the other extreme was that some decided, we're not going to listen to anybody. No one is a prophet. Because if that's the result, we don't want anything to do with any one any kind of prophet. And so Paul rebukes the people for despising prophecies. You, you see, they didn't have a Bible back then. And, and so the only way that, you, that a believer in the first century could hear from God was through the New Testament prophet. Now, that gift, that gifted man, the prophet, who spoke ex cathedra from God... God's truth, um, that, that gift has been replaced. It's been replaced by the Word of God. But the prophets were the, were the ones in the first century who spoke the very words of God. So Paul is saying to these believers, don't be suspicious, but be sensitive to God's voice. Just because there's false prophets doesn't mean that all of them are false. 
Now for us today, the application would be accept godly advice, accept biblical instruction from those who are responsible to teach the word, check it out, check what they say against the word, and if it's solid with the word, then accept that advice. Take their instruction and follow it. We need to hear and obey the Word of God, and we need to take seriously the counsel that is given by those who God uses to speak to us. Now, it's in that context, the next sec section is written about occasional uncertain things. And this is where he says, we are to examine everything carefully. Verse 21, test everything. Now, now, don't lose this train of thought. This paragraph links the whole chain, right? In order for us to become contagious. Some things are uncertain. And because there are times we don't know what is from the Lord, or simply a distraction from the world or from the devil, we need to hear the information, and then we've got to test it. We need to examine everything carefully. And I think the command here is to be discerning, which puts to bed this idea that living spiritually is living gullibly. Just because the Lord has come into your heart doesn't mean he's cut off your head. Some Christians live like they're not supposed to think anymore. No, you're supposed to think. Don't believe everyone who who says, I, I speak to you from God. How are you to know the things that you are to accept? I think there's a threefold test that determines what is and isn't from God. Number one is what they say consistent with Scripture. That's why uh, Luke says in Acts 17, the people of Berea were more noble than those at Thessalonica, because they tested what Paul said against the scriptures to make sure what he said was true. You test everything according to the truth of scripture. Is what is being said submissive to the authority of the Lord Jesus? In other words, as a pastor, my responsibility is to teach the word of God. Not my opinion, the word of God. And does my teaching, my instruction, does it submit itself to the authority of the Word of God? We test it as it's true, spiritual, uh, scripturally, and then am I submissive to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? And then third, we pray, Lord, is this true? Is this right? Does this agree with your spirit? Then he goes on to say, test what, test everything. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. To the good cling, from evil abstain. Now, I, I, the beginning of this talk, I ask you if you had the courage to be contagious. I want to close with three statements that, and the three statements are something to remember, something to resist, and something to release. To remember. First, remember that the goal is to be an encouragement to others. We want to put courage into, in theos, inject God into the situation, into the relationship. That's our goal. Secondly, we need to resist the cheap imitations of spirituality. 
such as superficial laughter rather than joy. It's easy to fake a laugh. It is impossible to fake joy. Resist the superficial. And then lastly, release your fear of what others may think or say. I kind of like the counsel that came from Davy Crockett. It's a great quote. Be sure you're right, then go ahead. That's pretty good. Eugene Peterson, from his book, Run With the Horses, writes this. Life is difficult, Jeremiah. Are you going to quit at the first wave of opposition? Are you going to retreat when you find that there is more to life than finding three meals a day in a dry place to sleep at night? Are you going to run home the minute you find that the masses of men and women are more interested in keeping their feet warm than living at risk for the glory of God? Are you going to live cautiously or courageously? I call you to live at your best, to pursue righteousness, to sustain a drive toward excellence. It's easier, I know, to be neurotic. It's easier to relax in the embracing arms of the average. Easier, but not better. Easier, but not significant. What is it you really want, Jeremiah? Do you want to shuffle along with the crowd or run with the horses? He concludes with this. The euphoric impetus of youthful enthusiasm no longer carried Jeremiah. He weighed the options, he counted the costs, he tossed and turned in hesitation. The response, when it came, was not verbal, but biographical. His life became his answer. I shall run with the horses. Let me ask you a question. Are you running with the horses? Are you courageous? Contagious? Or just dull? Have you settled for mediocrity or have you decided to be different? Not to play at this game we call Christianity. Not to traffic in unlived truth but to be distinctively Christian, even if it makes people uncomfortable. Go back through this list this week and ask yourself, is that me? If it is, you will be contagious. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the rebuke from your word. You've laid out for us, Lord, exactly how you want us to live. Even tell us this is your will. To rejoice always, to pray continually, to always be thankful to be sensitive to the Spirit, to listen to your word, to test everything, and to hold on to what is good. Lord, may we be people that do just that, to live sensitively to your Spirit as you seek to transform us into images of yourself that will be the kind of contagion that our world needs. Thank you for the truth. Do what you do that only you can do, and that is bring about change in my life, in each of our lives, for your glory. 
We pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.